Good morning. We come in our daily Bible reading to Acts chapter 10. And what we find in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts is a powerful sign from God that the kingdom is truly open for everyone. Now, you may be thinking that this is what we found out in Acts chapter 2, and that's true. The kingdom was open, and that's what Peter would preach to the Jews who had gathered at Pentecost. But in Acts chapter 10, we learn about a new group that is most certainly part of the kingdom and how surprising it might be to the first century Christians, and yet how understandably and important it is for us today to know that Gentiles, too, are part of the kingdom. In Acts chapter 10, we meet such a one. In verse 1, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. Now, as you think about this, this is important for a lot of reasons. Number one, we have Cornelius, who is a Gentile. And as we mentioned before, we're going to see that the kingdom of Christ is open to Gentiles as well as Jews. But in addition to this, it's interesting we learn something about what a devout man, someone who fears God, does. In verse 2, what did he do? He gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. And while Cornelius is not yet a Christian at this part of Acts chapter 10, I think we see that someone with the right heart fears God and takes care of others. Isn't that essentially what the old law amounted to anyway? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and also love your neighbor as yourself? See, Cornelius understood this. Another common question that comes up that I think is interesting in the case of Cornelius is about what about answered prayers to someone who's not a Christian? Well, in Cornelius's case, he is clearly doing what? He's clearly seeking to please God. And this matches so much of what Jesus would preach about, that when you seek God, when you ask of him something in good faith, he will answer, he will deliver, he will show himself. And so while God doesn't answer the prayers of a sinner, someone who's setting their ways against his, if someone is willing to seek God, he is willing to hear them. We see that in the Old Testament and we see that in the New Testament. And here he is fulfilling that promise by answering Cornelius' prayers. And now while he's praying to him, he says, you need a call for Peter. Well, this is going to be interesting for Peter because Peter being a Jew and an apostle who has preached on the day of Pentecost, he knows the kingdom's open. But what we're going to find out in chapter 10 is he may or may not understand fully that that what that means and embrace the idea that Gentiles are part of this kingdom too. In verse 9, the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Now, this is powerful. We sometimes wonder, how does God work? And in this case, he's all over the scene. You see the Spirit appearing essentially to Cornelius. In the case of, as you go back to verse 4, he's staring at him. In fact, he's in terror as he sees this vision of the angel of the Lord. And of course, you also see the Spirit directly, you might say, in verse 19, saying to Peter, these three men are looking for you. Go with them. So God is taking care of Cornelius, and he's also guiding Peter along the process. This is important for us to see both sides of the fence. When we're not pleasing God, when we're, when we're not Christians yet, we need to make sure that we're seeking God and know that he will take us to where we need to be. But on the other hand, if you are a Christian, if you are someone who's like Peter, then we need to be willing to be guided by God wherever he may send us. We need to be open. We need to be willing to find out, even if we have some visions, you might say, or at least read the Bible text and see what God says, and we don't fully understand, allow God to provide that understanding. Seek it. Seek to understand, but be willing to be a useful tool in a service in the meantime. Now, as you're looking at verse 22, they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, 
was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guest. Now, this is interesting because in verse 25, when Peter enters, Cornelius falls at his feet and worships him. But Peter has very important language for us. He says in verse 26, stand up. I too am a man. Even though Peter worked miracles, even though Peter could give someone who was paralyzed the ability to move, he could raise someone from the dead, all these things that Jesus did, Peter realizes that he is just a man. The apostles, as powerful as they were, as guided by the Holy Spirit directly as they were, they were still men. That would explain Peter's mistakes before and after the re resurrection of Jesus. That would explain even what he's telling Cornelius. Only God deserves worship. And by the way, as we go back and think about our John Daily Bible reading, it's so important that Jesus would talk about the fact that he was God, that he was worthy of worship, that he was worthy of that kind of praise, because that is unique. Only God deserves this worship. And of course, he's speaking with them. In verse 28, he points out something interesting. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. Now, this is interesting. In verse 28, Peter says, you know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate essentially with a Gentile. But now I understand that vision God sent me. What, what is the takeaway from that vision? I shouldn't call any person common or unclean. That is, Peter, as a representative of Jesus, as a witness of Jesus, was to speak to everybody, not just the Jews. Now, we read this and we think this is so obvious, but keep in mind, for Peter, this would be powerful. And there's a powerful lesson for us. I think we know the gospel is for everyone, but here's my tough question. Do we act that way? Do we present the gospel message? Are we willing to invite someone to church? Are we willing to talk to someone about the good news of Jesus as long as it's convenient and easy? As long as they look like us, as long as they act like us, talk like us? Or do we kind of hand select, well, this seems like a good person, or this seems like a good person? I understand that Peter was drawn by the Spirit to Cornelius, and Cornelius had sent uh, by being visited by an angel of God to Peter. But we have to be willing to look at everyone, too, and see everyone needs God. I need God, and so I should share that good news of salvation with everyone, no matter where they've come from, no matter what they look like, and no matter where they are in life right now. They can turn to God if I can turn to God. Powerful story here in, in Acts chapter 10. So, of course, he asks, well, why have you sent me? And Cornelius explains what has happened. And he says in verse 33, so I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. You see, this is a statement of faith from Cornelius. You go back to verse 2. He's described as a devout man who fears God. And here you have in verse 33, a willingness to hear all that the Lord would command. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 7, in verses 24 through 27, Jesus talks about the foundations. One's built on the solid rock and one's built on sand. What's the difference in those two foundations? Well, yes, the foundation of sand will fall when the storms come, but what makes the foundation? The foundation of sand is someone who heard the words of Jesus, but didn't do them. On the other hand, the foundation of rock was the one who heard the words of Jesus and did them. That You can see that Cornelius is anxious to please God. When he hears what is said, you can just tell he's going to do it because of his right heart. That's the question I have to ask myself. Do I have that right heart? That no matter what God says, no matter how difficult, no matter how radical the change might have to be in my life, will I change? Will I be different? In verse 34 and 35, Peter has an aha moment. He says, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Our God is amazing. We struggle in this world with all kinds of political divides, racial divides, economic divides. We divide over this and divide over that. But God says the kingdom's for everyone. However, there is still criteria. God shows no partiality, but anyone from any background, any nation who fears him, remember that's what Cornelius did, and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now, who gets to define what is right? Well, the Lord does. Jesus gets to decide. God sets his will. Peter is a messenger of that as guided by the Holy Spirit. So in verse 36, as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the, of Nazareth, with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. 
And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And of course, you see in verse 43, to him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him received forgiveness of sins through his name. See, not surprisingly, what is Peter's message for Cornelius going to be? What do I need to know? What do I need to do? What has the Lord said? That Jesus came. He worked many signs and miracles to attest to the fact that he is God. He was crucified and buried after he died, but he was resurrected. Peter is a witness of that fact, and that is the, the centerpiece of the gospel, that Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected. And when we call on his name, when you believe in Jesus and all that that entails, when you fear God and do what is right, what is available in verse 43? Forgiveness of sins, in whose name only? Through the name of Jesus. Now, powerful words here to close the chapter. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain for some days. This is powerful. What we're going to see as an important phrase, both in this chapter and in the next, is this idea of the Holy Spirit coming out on the Gentiles. You see, the Jews are amazed because it means the kingdom is actually for the Gentiles too. If the Holy Spirit can fall upon them, this is God's sign of acceptance, of agreement, of welcoming them into the kingdom. But notice also that Peter still has a question. No matter what this giving of the Holy Spirit exactly means, baptism still followed. When someone asks, what does God require of me? It is absolutely belief in the name of Jesus Christ and constantly linked, particularly in the book of Acts, to that idea of belief in Jesus is the need to be baptized. And the need to be baptized, as verse 47 says, in water, and as verse 48 concludes, in the name of Jesus Christ. Powerful story from a powerful loving God. Am I open to all people? Am I open to going where God sends? Do I have a heart that fears God and does what is right, taking care of his fellow creation and loving him first? Powerful challenges in Acts chapter 10. I hope you'll join us for tomorrow's Bible reading in Acts chapter 11.